All right, welcome everyone. Hope everyone is having a great first day of reInvent, packed with a lot of insightful and practical sessions so far. So in this one, we'll take you for a tour, and not around the racetrack as the name of the session might suggest, but rather through the selection of topics uh, around, the, uh, around building video streaming workloads that our customers, a lot of our customers care about. Uh, my name is Kamil Bogac, I'm a solution architect specializing in edge uh, services. And later I'll be joined by my colleague, Nicolas Veil, a product manager for AWS Elemental Services. And we are also thrilled to present this session with James Bradshaw from Formula One uh, Digital Technology Group, who will share what was Formula One journey and how they leveraged those services as they build their own video streaming platforms for motorsports fans around the world. <clears throat> so before we dive in, uh, let me just give you a quick overview of what we'll be covering in this session. And what's the level of depth as far as technical leveling goes? It is 300 level session, and so we assume you're familiar with some of the concepts around the subject of media streaming, such as encoding, packaging, uh, content delivery network, or caching. And if video streaming is a new technological endeavor for you, this session still might be of value for you as it will give you a cross section of topics to think about as you start working on your own uh, media workloads. So we'll start off with the bird's eye view on the over-the-top uh, delivery. So what are the trends and the key building blocks in the realms of internet scale delivery? And then we'll invite James on stage to walk us through what were the key considerations for Formula One as they were arch architecting their platform and what services and the features allow them to achieve the desired outcomes. And that will frame the rest of this talk in which Nicolas and myself will unpack those services and features um, to give you a better understanding how those can help you in building robust and performant video streaming platforms in AWS. So no matter what video streaming means for your business, I think we can all agree um, how a video streaming has changed video services landscape over the years. And we don't have to be industry experts to know that because we can refer to our own personal experiences in um, how consuming video content has changed. So it's been more than a decade since we witnessed the race of subscription VOD platforms, which give us, uh, the viewers, much more control in how we consume video content. And going forward, we start seeing more and more prestigious sport events, which used to be the main of broadcast television, are now being exclusively available online. And I think this itself really speaks to how those uh, video streaming technology has matured over the years and that inter internet delivery can meet the highest standard of the broadcast television. And this tangible shift in our watching choices is also well reflected in the uh, market trends. And we find, for example, in Omdia's report uh, published earlier this year, this interesting projection which says that uh, by the end of 2025, the total number of video subscriptions, both pay TV and online, online platforms, will reach a total of 2.8 billion <coughs> billions globally. And all that growth will be attributed almost exclusively to the, video uh, to the online video subscription, which is expected to double between 2020 and 2025. So we see a strong trend here and opportunities it creates uh, but it also prompts a question, uh, what will draw the viewers to your service and what will make it stand out? Because making the content available online is a first goal in itself, uh, but then going beyond that goal, you need to rethink what is the new and compelling viewer experience that you want to offer. So to follow that thought process, uh, we can take traditional broadcast TV as a, as a reference. It, gave rather, it gives rather basic viewing experience in which all the, all the viewers watch the same video of, uh, feed from start to finish. And that can be viewed as a rather passive way of consuming the uh, video content, as it doesn't give that personalized feeling or control that the viewers wish for. So in contrast, in the realms of online video streaming, you can offer far more engaging viewer experience as the video now becomes part of a, of a complete application in which you can offer uh, controls for the viewers to switch between the different views, and, and also provide interactive components which are relevant in the context of what's happening on the screen. Um, so you can take an example, for example, of a sport game in which you can turn on a player tracking view that will display their names as they move around the field. 
Then you can select particular players, for example, to see their stats up until this point of the game, and furthermore, see on the timelines the period of times where they, when they were on the field. And I'm just scratching the surface of what's possible, and with the AWS uh, services, you can, in a, you can find a number of services and supporting features that will facilitate that interactive watching experience. So now, let's, it's time to go a little bit more technical, and let's start with identifying functional elements involved in the online video distribution chain, starting from the viewer side. So here, the main challenge still remains, how to provide the reliable and performant delivery over the, the internet. Because we have to remember that internet is still um, packet-based best of all delivery, um, and although, yes, the network speed in the last one has been, has been improving, still the path from your content origin to your viewers' networks can span multiple networks, and that means multiple handovers, and that's where the, uh, where the um, packets get dropped and leak congestion can occur. So to overcome that unreliable nature of the internet, you need to employ a content deliver network, which will give you a more direct way to reaching the viewers, and that would be a reliable distribution strategy. And one of the inevitable challenges of making your content available, available on, online is that it's not gonna be just your subscribers trying to reach for, for your premium content, uh, but there will be also a number of unauthorized viewers, and the problem of online piracy can become a major concern of yours at some point. So make sure that you also build in the right content protection mechanism um, in your initial design, um, and, and, and you start with it. Now, as you move towards over the top delivery model, you also find how diverse is your user base. Um, it's gonna be the whole spectrum of the network conditions, depending if uh, the viewer is on the mobile network of, or on the broadband, broadband connection. Uh, and it's also gonna be whole spectrum of the uh, device types, supporting specific video formats. So to account for all that variance, you need also a video processing element that will produce multiple version of your original content in different formats and appropriate bitrate ladder as well. Um, it's also very important that you have reliable way of transferring your content from the source location, uh, especially if you're relying on the in those unreliable interconnections again. So leveraging ingest services that can support a dedicated transport protocols uh, that are optimized for reliable video, video delivery or even private network connection would be a crucial, crucial thing for maintaining uninterrupted uh, service. And alongside video processing step, you can also employ the workflows that will process and analyze your video content to extract all of that useful metadata that you can incorporate in your uh, workflow to enrich viewer experience. So the good news is you'll find all of, all of the elements of this puzzle in AWS to build that end-to-end -end streaming uh, workflow, encompassing all the functional elements that I just outlined. So in this example, of the reference architecture, you'll see that it's not just one, but actually multiple of services that would form the final solution. And each one have, has a specific role to play. So you'll probably spot number of AWS elemental services, and those would usually correspond to the ingest and video processing stages of that generalized workflow that I just described. Um, and you will also find um, Amazon Cloudfront for uh, distribution in, for the most part. Now, what will be the right architecture for you? It depends, of course. It depends on what's the workload type, whether that's live or VOD, uh, what are the glass-to-glass la -glass latency requirements, what's the expected device coverage, uh, but even more pragmatic things as, you know, how much in-house expertise or resources you have to manage this solution. So, um, in all those cases, I'm sure you find the right combination of services uh, in AWS to support your unique use case. And on that note, let me invite James on stage to talk about the results that Formula One was able to achieve with those services. Thank you. Good afternoon. So, 
Let me start by uh, talking a little about the products that we have in the market today. We have uh, Formula1.com, and that's the official source of all information, uh, whether that's breaking news, video, or editorial analysis. F1 TV is our flagship OTT subscription product. It's available in 115 countries or territories worldwide, and it streams live in 85 of those. Uh, live timing is our second screen product. Um, whether you're watching on F1 TV or another broadcaster or away from a TV altogether and want to keep track of all of the weekend's activities. F1 Fantasy allows uh, fans to compete with their friends in global fantasy leagues, and F1 Race Guide helps you find the toilets. I never pressed that button to make those video play, but it took me hours, so uh, there you go. Enjoy. Um, I can't talk about figures in terms of number of viewers, subscribers, that sort of thing. But our reach is global. Uh, this heat map shows unique IP addresses across our products in September this year. So this I treat as an approximation of fans engaging with our products. 71 million across 240 countries. Um, I wanted to give you a little flavor of the product itself um, uh, to help put the rest of the talk in context. I pressed play, that's good. Um, so F1 TV brings live replay highlights and exclusive uh, commission content together in one UI prioritizing content based upon recency, relevance, the day after making his grand as well as debut. enforcing it's variations we have in entitlements three, worldwide. Four, five, and in Saudi Arabia, we're racing. Perfect. So this is the start of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. Perez. And what Perez we're watching and listening to is F1 Live, which is F1's own commentary team with our own presentation channel, we call it. But the user can also use the channel switcher to move between uh, the onboard cameras. We have all 20 onboard cameras of all the drivers. Um, and each of those cars can have up to nine possible camera angles, six of which we can choose from, which is chosen by directors back at our HQ. And that's the, the particular image that you get out as a user. So um, the user can switch between those, and they can also hear the um, team radio uh, between one another. Note seven when you can. Oh, I timed that just right. That's good. So as well as these features, um, I mentioned that we have our own commentary team, um, but also the user can select from our international channel. And from there, on the international channel, you can listen to uh, six languages. Um, and you can also, I timed this right, uh, get subtitles for those additional languages as well. Uh, for three of them, I should say. One out of two ain't bad in terms of timing, so there it is. If, in case you didn't believe me, subtitles. Excellent. Um, so these closed captions, which you'll see in a second, um, are generated by AWS Transcribe. Uh, so they're an automated closed caption. Um, and if you look for my name in the app, you'll find that I'm talking about that in a different place at a different time. So, but let's move us on. So we believe that the exclusive content, the UI, and the features we've built in F1 TV make it the best way to experience F1 through a season, unless you have a ticket to every race. But that isn't the hard bit. The challenge is it lights out. The charts here show video play requests and concurrent viewers in the Hungarian Grand Prix earlier this year. Again, I can't show you the scale, but what I can show you is the rate, and that is the real challenge. In the 10 minutes prior to Lights Out, we get more play requests than the peak concurrent users, so the total number of users that will come in the race. 40% of the total request handled by our server are handled, or our platform, are handled in the 10 minute window, in that 10 minute window. In the two minutes prior to Lights Out, 30% of all users join. And at Lights Out, we've reached about 76% um, of our peak concurrency. So it is a, an enormous influx of users in a very short amount of time. 
But with the help of our delivery partners and AWS's edge services, we have really smoothed out that spike. The charts here show video bitrate and rebuffering percentages with the opening sequence plotted in red. Um, this is from uh, a race earlier this year. And you can see that video bitrate remains well above industry averages and rebuffering again well below industry averages. You'll see a, a minor uh, increase at the, open, at, the start, at the point of the opening sequence and that's due to just the sheer volume of new users starting video playback and requesting that first video segment, but still well below industry averages. And this is CloudFront at work. And of course, we need to serve fans globally, not just in the US or Central Europe, and CloudFront does that for us. As you can see from the um, 10 countries selected here, 10 territories selected here, um, we continue to deliver uh, a very high quality product uh, and CloudFront helps us ensure that users can watch the race well. So unglamorous but important to us and to our broadcast partners is content protection. And so in addition to just playback, um, we, we must take this into account. And unlike video and audio, um, the unique uh, and individual tokens and keys used can't be as effectively cached. Um, so again, scale is a problem here. Um, we needed a solution that was performant and scalable and able to handle massive load uh, when users arrived on the platform. So F1 worked with AWS uh, and a product team on a pre-GA service that allowed token validation to happen truly at the edge um, with each uh, invocation taking less than one millisecond. Um, that is CloudFront functions and we now see functions regularly, function invocations regularly exceed tens of millions requests per minute. So away from um, serving the content to how the content is managed uh, through its life cycle. Um, so throughout an entire race weekend, um, there's over 16 hours of uh, F1 content, and that's a lot to expect a fan to turn up and watch. So we needed to build a service that allowed people to dip in and out. Now, don't get me wrong, everybody's there for the race, but um, throughout the rest of the weekend, we wanted a really seamless experience. So we designed the service to make content available seamlessly, whether watching live, joining late, or catching up after the event. And we use Media Package, automated with Lambda functions, to transition live playback through these various states. Uh, so we have pre-live activity, uh, and that's when only our operators, our operations teams, can check that the streams are up, and the content's visible, and it's gonna be available for users uh, as and when we choose that the start of session goes live. And then we, they make the session live at that point, and in the front end of whether the, where you're on app, or a TV, or on the web, on web you're able to then see the session is live, it appears as a hero uh, in the product, and users can join. And then once the session actually starts, we use uh, a trimming function, and we basically set a new start point for that video asset. So instead of the nice background music that we play in advance so users know that um, content's coming, uh, we set that trim point, which means that when users arrive on the platform and click um, watch from start as opposed to watch live, it means that they start at exactly that um, perfect um, starting point of the program. And then at the end of a session, we again set a trim point, and that sets and marks the asset as what we call pseudo FER, full event replay. And, and really that doesn't change anything in terms of the playback experience for users. It's still streaming it um, in a sort of DVR mode in the same way that a user who turned up late would, would be, um, but we mark it in the front end as replay, so a user knows this, uh, this session is finished. And then at a time of our convenience, the operations team, we then used a harvest function. And then that actually captures uh, the, um, the asset. And remember, not just one stream, but uh, over 20 different simultaneous streams and all of the audio that goes with it, package that up into one full event replay. Uh, and then that is available for, well, forever. 
and, and crucially, with no disruption or, uh, or any gap in the playback experience, users can watch it the second that the, uh, that the content's finished. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. So just uh, following on uh, James' explanation of their uh, workflow, um, the way it works from a service perspective is that um, you have the, the contribution going through Media Connect, uh, the ABR encoding uh, done by Media Live, and Media Live ingest the um, HS stream, the live HS stream, onto Media Package, which, which takes care about the uh, the packaging in the various formats uh, that are being used, as well as the encryption and the DRMization of the streams. So in the first stage, what you get is a live playback URL uh, that gives you the, the live stream. Uh, as we keep all of the incoming uh, content uh, from MediaLive for 14 days uh, on disk, on S3, uh, you can play uh, every single segment of this live session uh, through uh, the various steps, which is here, the pseudo replay phase, where actually you just add a start query string parameter to your live URL, and then you get a growing manifest that can grow up to until uh, 24 hours. So basically, you, you have like, uh, and you can also, of course, add an end parameter that gives you a VOD content out of a live endpoint. So you have basically 14 days um, to actually play this content uh, through the live endpoint. But if you want to keep the content for a full VOD uh, replay, then you have to harvest. So this is another uh, subservice of Media Package that actually allows you to uh, call an API to extract one portion of the DVR stream onto S3. Starting from there, you have multiple options. Um, you can either originate uh, statically from S3, uh, because you can also harvest uh, from encrypted endpoints, so you could, uh, you, could have, you could originate from S3, or you could also, uh, as uh, Formula One is doing, uh, re-ingest this harvested content onto Media Package VOD, which actually gives you uh, a new VOD asset in the various formats, and all of the um, uh, encryption flavors uh, that you need for your, for your um, playback devices. So the way uh, we achieve resilience uh, through those workflows is by first using contribution encoders that are uh, synchronized in terms of time code. Um, they uh, ingest either directly, like on this diagram, or through Media Connect uh, onto Media Live. Uh, which actually receive like uh, two um, distinct ingest feeds, but synchronized in terms of time code, and also output two different streams that are what we call output locked, uh, meaning that they are similar, they are symmetric onto media package. And what media package is doing is that it's uh, looking at um, the completeness in terms of uh, segments availability on those two ingest pipelines, and actually automatically fail over. Uh, onto the second pipeline if there is a problem and segments are missing on the, on the primary pipeline. And from a, a CDN and a player perspective, there is a single playback URL uh, because the, uh, the endpoints of media package, they actually leverage the, the right uh, input pipeline at the right time. Moving on to the, uh, the content protection topic, the way we achieve uh, the encryption and the DRMization is by using a framework that we call uh, SPEAK, which is a secure packager and encryptor key exchange framework, uh, which is basically built on top of CPIX. Uh, so this is a, a Dash IF uh, standards for the uh, exchange of keys. Uh, so we uh, basically build an API and a framework on top of CPIX. Uh, it, allow, it allows to integrate a media package or other packagers like uh, Media Convert uh, together with the, the key servers from the DRM uh, service providers. Uh, so that's done through this uh, API gateway, uh, that component that we see in the middle, uh, which we call the, uh, the speak server, and it's uh, actually a Lambda script that is usually provided by the, the DRM partner, and that actually makes the bridge in terms of requests between media package and the key server. Um, 
Optionally, uh, you can also use certificates. Uh, those certificates are actually used for encrypting the content of the key, the value of the key inside the CPX document, so that your, your key never uh, transits in the clear uh, on the network. Of course, everything is over uh, HTTPS, um, so you first have to break this layer in, in, in order to get the, uh, the actual CPX document, but in case you get it, uh, what you get is an encrypted um, uh, content key value. And so afterwards, the, the rest of the workflow is, is uh, standard, uh, meaning that the, the player is requesting the keys from the, the DRM platform, uh, gets the keys, and decrypts the content uh, coming from the CDN uh, CloudFront in this case. Today we have uh, SPIC v1 and SPIC v2. The, difference, the main difference is that SPIC v1 is uh, using one key, one encryption key for all of the contents, audio and video. And SPIC v2, as suggested in this diagram, is using multiple keys for multiple tracks based on the number of audio channels or based on the video resolution so that you can have a specific key to protect your 4K content and it's different from the SD or the HD key. So to conclude, I wanted to um, show you this um, diagram, which is uh, initially a feature, uh, the KLV metadata support, that was developed for aerial surveillance purposes, where there are like uh, tons of um, data points that are actually produced for every video frame. Uh, so KLV is a, is a simple key length value uh, mechanism um, where the, the, the payload is actually binarized, so it's very lightweight, and it's, it's, it's really designed for very intensive metadata uh, production. Uh, so you can imagine to produce one payload of metadata per video frame, and it, this payload is gonna be synchronized with the video. Um, and you can develop uh, specific dictionaries for specific sports um, in order to, to simplify the player implementation. So in this example, we, we could imagine as an extension to uh, what Formula One is, is providing today in terms of experience, to add telemetry data points coming from every single uh, car in the race uh, with, a, with a series of data points like, as you see in the screen, like the speed, the steering, um, the fuel level, uh, as well as the tire pressure for each and every car. Uh, this metadata would be actually ingested into a, a small encoder that would be also uh, uh, embedding the, uh, the video uh, source signal. This uh, encoder will produce a contribution stream that actually uh, includes the KLV metadata in the TS stream. Uh, Media Live uh, actually supports uh, the, uh, the encoding in ABR uh, to Media Package and retains this KLV metadata. Media Package, um, when repackaging the, uh, the ingest content, uh, to Dash actually uh, transforms those KLV uh, payload uh, into e-message boxes. And on the player side, what we can imagine is that a end user could actually select all of the telemetry data points that are uh, of interest and uh, actually display all of those real-time telemetry data points uh, on the interface uh, as an overlay, um, so in a very dynamic way, in a very customized way per end user. I guess that's the, um, the last slide for this section. Thanks. All right, so now that Nicolas covered some of the aspects of content preparation, what's left now is to deliver your stream reliably, uh, reliably to your viewers. And we already mentioned some of the challenges of getting satisfying performance if you rely on those standard internet delivery paths. Uh, so in order to achieve high bit rates and low rebuffering rates that you've seen in James' slide, um, you need a dedicated and distributed platform like Amazon CloudFront, which is AWS Content Delivery Network. And again, referring to James' slide, it was almost self-evident what are the qualities customers like Formula One look for in the CDN of their choice to support their traffic patterns. So first one is global coverage, um, in which uh, sh should match well the geogra geographical distribution uh, of your viewers, as that proximity to your viewers will then result in the re reduced network distance to your content. And the second one is scale. 
So that proximity to the viewers must also be backed with the right amount of uh, capacity to support the largest uh, scale events. And Cloudform is able to meet both of those expectations uh, with its global footprints of more than 410 pops in over 90 cities in more than in, in, in 48 countries. Um, and also, what you should remember that for the best user experience, the quality of connection from your media origin to those edge locations is just as important as the proximity to your uh, viewers, as any type of network slowness, any type of network issue, as you move your content from your origin to those edge locations that CloudFront is, is made of, would have severe impact on the, uh, on the viewing experience for a large portion of your population, uh, of the audience. So what can be overlooked in that uh, as a key performance, uh, as a key performance uh, factor is the impact of AWS global network which interconnects uh, uh, CloudFront pops with the AWS regions. Um, now, AWS Global Network is made of high bandwidth and redundant links, uh, but most importantly, mo importantly, it's also privately managed by AWS. And because we have good understanding of the traffic patterns of that network, we are in great position to scale that uh, appropriately and build into it the path diversity to provide the best possible um, performance and re reliability of delivery. So think about all the benefits of having this continuity of uh, delivery over the dedicated infrastructure all the way up from your media origin to the viewer's network. So having the platform of this case sets the right, right foundation for reliable media delivery um, but having big like events pose some unique challenges that CloudFront needs to also address effectively. And what I'm referring to are specifically the traffic patterns that look similar to the example showed by James around the start of the, of the race. When in a short period of time, all the viewers start watching the streams almost, uh, almost simultaneously. And this can create local hotspots on the platform if that sudden lo uh, load increase concentrates on one or few uh, pop, uh, local pops, as each of those pops has limited capacity to offer. And so CloudFront ability uh, to quickly, uh, to, to change without quickly changing the amount is, will be another determining factor of the quality of experience. And that ability lies in the CloudFront's routing process, which is responsible for directing the viewers to the most optimal pop. And you can think of it as a almost continuous bean packing exercise, where on the left you have load inputs coming from different viewer networks. Um, and on the right you have CloudFront pops, uh, which can be viewed as a buckets of limited capacity. So um, CloudFront would regularly quantify what's the load for each viewer network, and then makes an allocation decision based, uh, based on those inputs. Rou routing system does that. Uh, to allocate that load between the pops. And as the viewer network load for, for each of those uh, viewer networks gradually increase, CloudFront will adjust its routing decision um, and the allocation output, outputs to shift uh, the traffic between the pop before any, any of them gets close to its capacity limits. However, in our scenario, we are not dealing with the smooth and gradual increase in demand. So what happens during that short period of time when everyone starts watching the same uh, stream is that the inputs to that routing process, so namely viewer network loads, um, becomes very dynamic all of a sudden. So when we take the measurements of those viewer network loads uh, at, at that certain point, by the time the routing process produces new allocation outputs, that load has already changed because how steep is that traffic growth curve? And that can create, a, um, and that difference, which is depicted here as that faded color, uh, is small and manageable for the most time uh, for Kraton routing process. Uh, however, during large scale events like that, uh, it can create surplus of load that can push speci specific pop to, to its limit. So is there anything we can do about it? 
Well, there is, because if we think about the demand and supply equation that we are trying to solve here, although we cannot control the demand, we can control the supply inputs, because each of those platform pops has a certain capacity limit set, uh, set on it. So independently from measuring viewer network's load, we also keep track of what's the load on each of the pop, uh, pops reported. Um, and then if any of those pop, pops it starts running hot because of all of that sudden uh, increase in, in traffic, we have also quick feedback loop from those pops to the uh, routing process, uh, which will instruct it to lower the, uh, the capacity target on those pops. And because we lower that capacity target that naturally push the, the routing system, to shift the traffic more quickly from the affected pops. So having that combination of scale and traffic dispersion mechanism like that uh, allows CloudFront to um, handle the traffic peaks behind those large scale events. However, during those highly popular streaming events, there's another uh, key objective that we cannot lose sight of, which is maximizing uh, origin offload. And that's especially true when we are dealing with media origins, which tends to be more sensitive to the increased number of, re of requests, um, and which can turn into availability issue. If during the event, all of a sudden, we have sudden surge of requests reaching the origin, that can, that can overwhelm that origin. So we also have right countermeasure for that in CloudFront. First one being request collapsing which reduces the number of parallel requests when multiple viewers simultaneously make, uh, make a request for the same object. That object could be, for example, video segment in, in the live streaming. And if that specific segment is not in the CloudFront's pop cache yet, um, what CloudFront will do, it will check if there's any in-flight request for, for that object, and if there is, it will wait for that single response coming back from the origin and will use it to satisfy all of the um, re requests that came in the meantime. Then to further optimize the origin offload, we also built mid-tier caching layer. Um, so the reason it is important is that, you know, as we already said, we are at the level of 410 plus pops around the world. But it was just three years ago when we announced that we reached our uh, 200 pops milestone. So you may, you may think over that period of time, we doubled the load on the origin because the, we double number of pops, right? But that's exactly not the case. And this is the reason why we maintain 13 regional edge caches, which act as a upstream caching layer, layer for CloudFront pops. And those regional edge caches are also spread globally uh, and single regional edge cache would fit uh, content to the multiple pops which are the closest to it. And having that mid-tier layer goes already a long way um, in improving the origin offload, but you can optimize it even further by introducing another incremental layer of caching called origin shield. So um, you can activate origin shield for each of the origin you have defined in your CloudFront configuration. Uh, and you do that by choosing a preferred region, which will now play a role of a central caching layer. So once you select that region, basically what happens is that you promote regional, uh, regional edge cache in that region to become now incremental layer of caching for N everyone else. And the way this changed the high level request flow is that for all the origin fetches coming from the other reg regional edge caches, which normally would go directly to the origin, they will be now routed through that origin shield layer for the final cache check. And we have a lot of media customers who observe a notable improvements in the, in the, of, of the offload in the use cases when they have a viewer base spread around multiple regions, when they have large VOD libraries with long tail content, or in the scenarios when they use multiple CDN strategy to serve the, uh, serve the viewers. So if your workload falls into any of those scenarios, um, Try and test it and see for yourself what kind of improvements on offload you can, you can observe. So with all the mentioned optimization in place, and now we can take a look at the offload results Formula One observed on their CloudFront distribution around the time of the start, start of the race. So what this chart shows is the cache heat ratio metric uh, over time. And this metric is a direct measure of offload's efficiency, as it basically tells us 
um, what percent of the requests were served from the CloudFront cache, and consequently the reminder uh, would represent the origin fetch, so the request that made it all the way to the origin. And we can see that 10 minutes before the race uh, starts, we are at the level of 94% of cache hit ra measured cache hit ra radio, but as measured from the edge locations. And, and that's denoted by that red line at the bottom. And then it progressively climbs up to around 95.6% as the stream becomes widely popular and there's more new viewers joining the stream. So 94, 95%. That's a good start, a good place to start, you may think. Uh, but also remember that behind that almost steady line, there's also this very steep traffic curve that was shown by James, uh, which represents all these new, new viewers start, that start watching the, uh, the stream. And when, so when translated to absolute values, that remaining 5% uh, representing origin fetches uh, could equal to tens of hundreds or hundreds of requests at the beginning but then over the time uh, turn into tens of thousands of requests as the viewership reaches it, its peak. And you get, when you get to that point, that could overwhelm the origin. So having this perspective, now you see how the important are all of those other optimizations which close that gap. And you can see that the actual resulting upload and that Formula One observed was at the level of 99.8%. Uh, which is a collective result of all the caching players were working in concert, all the way up from the edge, um, uh, cloud from the edge locations, through regional edge caches, and origin sheet layers, combined with the request collapsing. Now, to shift the gears a little bit, uh, let's bring back the topic of content uh, protection. So we already briefly talked about DRM, which allows you to encrypt your video segments at the content preparation stage. And the second anti-piracy barrier that you can install at the CDN level is token-based access control. Now, token-based access control is a method of restricting access on the basis of the viewers presenting the proof that they have been already authorized uh, to access the video content. And this proof comes in the form of the cryptographically signed token, which is generated by the playback services at the point where the viewer requests access to the stream from a playback API services. And then subsequently, that token is uh, subject to the token validation logic that must be run on CloudFront on, as a CDN of your choice. And so when the viewer, make, uh, when the viewer holding the token makes a request, uh, CloudFront will basically act as a gatekeeper in this process and will check integrity of that token and whether that request fulfills all of the access conditions specified in the, in, in the token in order to decide whether to allow or deny that request. Um, so what I refer to as uh, access conditions are technically token uh, claims which describe the context in which the token can be used. So by when, by whom, and for what assets. And so the token validation logic basically checks if the viewer request attributes fits in that, con that context, and if there's any mismatch there, it will block the request. Now, um, talking about those access conditions, they will determine the efficacy of the, of the token-based solution. And your goal here is to limit the token usage from both ends. So ideally, a single token should grant an access to a single video assets to a unique viewer. So scoping down the token to a set is quite straightforward. Um, you just have to specify the URL path pattern um, that will cover your, your video assets and include that in a token as a claim. But sometimes it gets more complicated than that. And here you can see example of how the playback URL can change in a single playback session where, for example, you have a server side uh, insertion involved. As in this case, you have multiple endpoints uh, responsible for handling manifests, content segments, ad segments, impressions, etc. So for those use cases, your token-based solution should be flexible enough to accommodate all of that variance um, in, that, that cannot be covered by a single path pattern. Now on the viewer side, uh, what you would care the most is, um, is to mitigate the risk of link sharing. And that can happen when a token 
which, which was generated by a legitimate user, uh, is shared and reused with unauthorized viewers who, who in that case get uh, unauthorized access to your stream. And so to prevent that from happening, you should include in, in the token claims set of attributes which are unique to that specific uh, viewer. As this will provide the session uniqueness such that anyone else attempting to use the same token would fail at the validation stage um, because um, that bad actor's attributes would differ from the original requester. And here are the example of the viewer attributes that you can use in that process of narrowing down um, and the viewer attributes in the scope of the token. Now, as you define the structure of your token, uh, keep in mind that the more difficult it is to spoof those attributes, the more difficult it will be uh, to circumvent that co uh, content protection. Okay, so having this understanding, let's move to the practical implementation of this concept, starting with the central element of this protection method, which is token validation logic. So what has proven to be a viable and effective implementation for Formula One, but also their customer as well, was CloudFront functions. And it's a feature of CloudFront which allows you to define your own custom processing logic in the form of JavaScript code that would be invoked for every request that reaches CloudFront. And what makes CloudFront function fit for purpose in, in this case is that it can seamlessly follow the traffic patterns for the largest media workloads. Um, in, in a way that there's, no there's, there's not any scaling consideration that you should be worried about. And it also executes in less than one millisecond, having no overall impact on latency or performance. So we know it's the right tool for the job, but we also know there's a long way from having actual working solution. And as we assisted customer, customers like Formula One and other media customers in that journey of building tokenization solution, we recognize how significant project in itself this can be with a number of dependencies and design choices to be made. So to help you make that leap and deploy tokenization solution in your architecture, we published a few months ago a, a comprehensive solution called Secure Media Deliver at the Edge, uh, which includes all of, all of the logic and required components in the form of the cloud formation or CDK templates that you can easily deploy in your video workloads that run on CloudFront. So the idea here is, is to give you end-to-end -end working solution, which is well-architected, provided by AWS, and that will, in, that will include all of the core uh, functionalities. So we already spoke about the token validation run by CloudFront functions. Um, then um, we also have token generation Node.js Node library, key rotation uh, workflow, and the example of playback API, which also integrates that Node.js library to generate the tokens. Now, what I'm showing here as a key benefit started as our design principles as we, that we took on board as we've been developing this, uh, this solution. And those really reflect what we have, we have been hearing frequently from our customers in terms of what are the outcomes that they expect. So, Putting technicalities aside, uh, the design so we try to design a solution that caters to ease of, uh, ease of integration so that it becomes incremental security layer that can be easily added to your existing workloads running on the CloudFront without any impact on the client side or on the origin side. And simplicity of the solution also comes from the fact that we use path-based tokens which are added into URL path instead of using cookies, queries, strings, or anything else. And because of that, this solution is then universally supported by a wide range of players and, and platform and eliminates any need for uh, manifest rewrites. Then the second is performance and scale. So while you would deeply care about protecting your content, it should never come at the price of worse quality of experience or creating a risk that you would reach scaling limits. And because CloudFront function is central to this solution, it addresses both of those concerns as we discussed previously. And lastly, uh, the goal was also to reduce operational overhead 
and we took really full advantage of other AWS services to orchestrate and automate certain operations that your team would have to perform by themselves otherwise. For example, key rotation workflow in a way that it wouldn't disrupt the uh, service operations. So those type of automation is also segue to the next topic. Uh, so adding, um, adding those secure uh, access token also opens up new possibilities in identifying um, leaked playback sessions that can come as a result of the piracy activities. And this could still may happen because you may still have some bad actors trying to circumvent, circumvent that protection method by basically falsifying their attributes in a way that would allow them to take and reuse someone else's token and by doing so gain an unauthorized access. Uh, and that can usually happen when you are a little bit less strict about how you narrow down the, the scope of the token in terms of the viewer attributes. Um, so since we said that single token should be unique to, to a single viewer, then what we can actually do is to also create and incorporate into the token a unique session ID. And then once you do that, having that unique session ID, you would expect that only a single viewer would use that session ID. And once that's done, you can look for indicators that suggesting otherwise, that that single session, that single session ID is actually used by multiple viewers. So the obvious signals to look for would be things like, is there multiple uh, values of user agent or referrer headers behind that single session ID? Another one would be multiple source IPs behind that single session, right? You can also even apply simple, simple statistical um, analysis uh, that would also bring actionable findings. So for example, you can define acceptable um, request range um, for, for a single session, taking 50th percentile as a reference. And you would expect that the request rate coming from the legitimate session would fall into that range that you defined. And then when you spot this type of outlier, you would know that this is, this is, um, that this is clearly that session uh, has been leaked and has been used by multiple unauthorized viewers. So you can see that um, those secured tokens also provide some key inputs in the process of identifying compromised session that you can harvest. So then we thought how we can materialize that concept and make it more manageable for you in that solution that, that I um, described previously. So, but the very first thing that you need to take care of is to enable access logs on your CloudFront configuration, as this will generate all those data points uh, that will feed that whole process. And from that point onwards, you can, um, you can deploy automatic session revocation workflow, which is embedded in the optional model, which is part of that solution, and you can enable that optional model at any time. And that workflow would then run at the reg regular intervals. It will pull the data from those access logs in order to parse the session ID and collects all those stats about uh, that session ID. And combining all the signals and that you look at the previous slide, it will derive suspicion score uh, for each of the session. And then it will distill the ones which are above the threshold that, that you set. So that, and so by that, you will get a list of, of the sessions that will be set to be revoked. And are revoked by pushing the list of those sessions uh, to, to AWS WAF rule group, which is associated with CloudFront distribution. That will then end up uh, blocking those compromised sessions midstream. So if auto session revocation or this solution in general, general seems like the right um, solution for you, you know, make sure you visit the solution page and you'll find the links for the implementation template and the implementation guide. And that brings us to the end of the session. So I hope you find some actionable insights from this session that you can apply for your new or existing video streaming workloads. Um, and as usual, as for any relevant session, please provide the feedback in the post-session survey.